What's up, Jammies? Welcome back to another episode of Ricky's Ram Jam presented by Barefoot Wine. What a win over the Browns, 36 to 19. Puka went over a thousand yards for the season. John Johnson had a game changing interception. Kyron got in the end zone again. AD and Kobe Turner had a split sack for a safety. It was such an exhilarating game. I loved watching it. The energy in SoFi was immaculate. Yes, I use that word immaculate because that's what it felt like on Sunday. This piece from Coach McVay's presser made me laugh. Check it out. I would be willing to bet you that a lot of people would say just run it down to 30 seconds, kick the field goal to go up 11, and then, you know, don't even give them any time to potentially have what Flacco did against, you know, the Browns, uh, you know, a year ago. So it was it was some debate, but I think out of respect for their field goal block operation, we said uh, it, let's make sure we have great ball security, but if we can punch it in, um, you know, Kyron's on my fantasy team. It's a joke. <laughs> it's a joke. I don't really mean that. All right, kidding. So yeah, he was joking. Obviously, Kyron is not on his fantasy team, but he is on mine. So I was super stoked that he got in the end zone. So that was great for me. So let's do that again this coming weekend against against the Ravens. So the Rams have won three in a row. We're now sitting at six and six, but and it's off to Baltimore, like I just alluded to. We're going to chat about that in a minute. But first, I was watching the Walter Payton Man of the Year surprise with Cooper Cup, which if you haven't seen that video, you should. It is so touching. So I'm I'm laying in bed this morning. I'm watching that video. It's like so touching. It has me in my feels like so excited for Cooper and like just everything that he has done. He is just such an exceptional person and player on and off the field. And then my door, there's like a banging at my door. I go, there's like five to 10 workers, which is great. You would think because, you know, from my background, or if you can hear from my my voice, my, my studio seems all nice and well, but we've had a lot of storms in Los Angeles recently and my house is very old and there are some cracks that have been coming through the walls and ceilings. And when I say cracks, like it looks like sort of the foundation is is not settling correctly because of all the rain in Los Angeles. Um, so they're they are under the floor right now. They're in the, on the in the foundation. There are men on the roof. There are my bedroom is completely covered in saran wrap because they're fixing the ceiling and the walls cracked back there first before they moved to the studio because I was like, I have to do a show. I don't have time to go somewhere else. Can you guys just start back there? So yeah, my house is falling apart, but the good news is is the Rams are six and six. My house is still standing, so as long as the roof, knock on wood, doesn't cave in on me while I'm doing the show, will be great to go. Um, th- things are good. It, it is December. It's the season of giving. I got the opportunity to go to the Shopathon with the Rams and Salvation Army um, on Monday with some children from a bunch of different areas of LA that we got to do a Shopathon, and we each had you know, a gift card and got to run through a Walmart and, and, and fill up, fill up their carriages. And it's, it's just such a special touching moment. Rampage was there. We had a bunch of players. It, it was just, it makes me so proud to be a part of this organization. And I know I'm a broken record when I say that type of stuff, but I, I really just, just love it. Last but not least, we had our last flag football game of the season last night and we won. We won. It was such a great showing. We had so much fun. There were a lot of injuries, a lot of um, blood and bruises. But my favorite thing is our friend Eli, who said, Erica, I better get a shout out in Ricky's Ram Jam. So Eli, I got you. He was running with the ball and someone dove for his flag and full blown ripped his pants like up the seam full And he was like, those are my favorite shorts. It was like my favorite moment of all time. So yeah, we we all are winning around here. Besides my house, everyone is winning. The Rams are winning. Our flag team won. Yeah, we may end up have ended up two and five in the season, but it is what it is, right? All right, let's raise a toast to my guest. He is the chief national reporter for NFL Network, and he was in attendance with me for the Rams week 13 win over the Browns. He is Steve Weish. Who's also a wino, and yes. that's I love talking wine with Steve. And you know that this show is is sponsored by Barefoot, so Indeed. we love a good glass of wine together. And we've we've shared many over the years. Yeah, salute, Erica. And yes, we have. Absolutely. We can't wait to the next one. I've got some some really really good ones for you. Some especially Ooh. from the winery that Stan Kroenke owns up in the oh. Santa Ines Valley. Wow, you know, I, actually, I'm a bad employee. I haven't tried that yet, so I'm I'm really happy that you brought that up. Oh my gosh! All right, well, 
Don't want to name drop because we are sponsored by Barefoot, but we'll bring, we'll talk offline about that. <laughs> perfect. Yeah. Any any type of wine, especially, you know, especially Barefoot, but all the all the wine is is good here. Okay, Steve. 3 in a row for LA. Yeah. Another complete win versus the Cleveland Browns. How have the Rams gotten stronger as a team since the bye? You know what's interesting is you know, and I was talking to Jordan Rodriguez of the Athletic about this because we've been with this team since they came back to LA since right. 2016 to head coaches. We've seen a lot of changes, but one of the constant themes is that the Rams have been a finesse team, right? They have not been a tough, tough physical December football outdoor type of football team. That's what I'm seeing out of this type of team. Kudos to Sean McVay and Les Snead for taking the talent that they have on this roster, a lot of young talent, and building a gritty tough team. Look at Kyron Williams, the tough yards that he gets behind an offensive line that did not let Matthew Stafford get cl- get gloved at all by arguably nope. the best defense in the NFL. Um, right. Defensively, what Raheem Morris has done with a bunch of young players and Aaron Donald being the straw that stirs a drink, denying teams once they get into the red zone from scoring touchdowns. Even the Super Bowl type of teams that we've seen, again, they were more high-flying, finesse, Let's get a lead and let our pass rushers get after the quarterback instead of, okay, you want to line up and, and bang? Well, we can do that too. And that and that's one thing that's really different and why I think the Rams will end up in the playoffs. I loved that um, piece that Jordan posted this weekend as well about, about the toughness of this team. Yep. And I implore anyone that hasn't read it to go check it out because not only is she a phenomenal writer, but I really love the, the insight that she had. Steve, I loved getting to sit next to you in the press box just to hear you sort of be breaking down. I learn so much when I'm <laughs> when I'm watching football with you, and it's like one of my favorite things. We watched that huge Puka rushing moment. He oh. did it again, 105 yards receiving, including a 70-yard touchdown, another 34 on the ground. Like, how good can this guy become? He he's amazing. Um, because you know, people say, well, he slipped because he didn't run the blazing 40, he is the example of football speed because you saw on that crossing route where he caught it and ran it, I ran two defenders and created distance between himself and the defenders. These are guys who are 4 3 40 guys, and he's out running them. Right, He's a big physical receiver, so the sky's the limit for him because this is where Sean McVay and Mike McDaniel have been great offensively is – they don't just line him up at one spot. He can play in the slot and do the tough guy stuff, right? Be that flanker role. He can play out wide. He can do some jet sweep type of stuff because he's got the speed. He's got the toughness, but he's got a certain instinct about him too that I'm not going to be the receiver who catches the ball and goes down, or I'm not going to be the guy who necessarily is going to sit there and tap dance with you until the pursuit comes that I'm hoping I can fake you out. I'm going to get north and south. I'm going to dig. And I'm going to make a play. And, and that his overall toughness, going up and getting the 50-50 balls, you know, just, just finding that extra yard. Again, he exemplifies this team when it comes to toughness. And the great thing about it, Erica, and you know this, you watch him play, it's still like a 13-year-old kid. Like, oh, I caught that ball? Okay, let me go make something happen. That was great. That was fun. Let's do it again. You talk toughness, too. I mean, he took that hit. He's oh. on the sideline, gri- gripping his rib. We're not sure if it's a shoulder or rib. After a Everyone- catch. After a great catch, the whole st- the air is taken out of the stadium. Just you're holding your breath. He goes out, goes to the locker room. Everyone's like, oh, you know, what's going to happen now? And he comes back in the next play. He's blocking. He's out on the field and he's taking blocks. Like you talk toughness of this kid. It is unbelievable to watch. He is, you know, and I don't think the Rams have Mr. Miyagi in the locker room, <laughs> you know, giving him a little bit of. And making that shoulder feel better. He's just tough. I mean, he did what he had to do to get back on the field. And he went out there and he helped the team have a very good second half. You know, they've diagnosed this as a sprained shoulder, but he may not miss any time. And I want people to understand, at this point of the season, when you have a sprained shoulder, it's hard to reach, right? He does a lot of interior blocking. You've got to grip and you've got to control big, strong guys. So this is something that is going to be painful for him. But here's something that Eric Yarber shared with me a couple weeks ago, fresh off the bye. He said, no player is going to benefit more from the bye than Puka Nakua. Because those Mm. first, when was the bye? Week 12 or 13? He's like, those first few games. Before Seattle, right. Right. That was his college season. He's never played longer 
You're right. Been built before. So he so it's it's the rookie wall. And they and, and Yarber told me said he was beat up. He was mentally worn down. He was physically beat up. And he came back after that bye, like he just came out of the womb, like I'm here to live a whole bunch of life. And you're seeing that. And again, that is a tribute to him, his commitment to this game to be good, his commitment to his teammates, but also to a coaching staff that understands, all right, we got a dude who's ready to rock here. Let's keep feeding him the ball. Yeah, I tore like a tiny tear in my rotator cuff and I had trouble putting coffee mugs away and yeah. reaching up to put coffee mugs away. I'm not comparing myself to a NFL athlete, but I mean, we're very similar. I think body types, me and Puka. Yeah. So I can I can relate to that to that type of pain. Seven touchdowns versus just one interception over the last two games for Matthew Stafford. Do you think people sometimes forget just how special he is? Yes. Yeah, they really do. I mean, because we're so focused now. You know, on C.J. Shroud, on Lamar Jackson, on Tua, you forget that Matthew Stafford is magical. And look, last year at this time, he was done, right? He had he had the elbow thing. He had the neck thing going on. From the first game, he has been a different-looking player. He looks like the guy who can play for three or four more years if he wants to continue to do that. And this is why I think if the Rams get into the playoffs – they're not just going to be happy getting – they can win games because of him. I mean, honestly, right. as, as, as threatening as Detroit is, if Matt has to go back and play a game at Ford Field, why wouldn't you think the Rams could win that game? With the way their defense right. has been playing, with the toughness their offensive lines are playing against a, a defense that's that's not – like Matthew is is that good. Look at the quarterbacks in the NFC and all of – you know, Jordan Love is looking great, this and that, but who would you honestly take – in the NFC over Matthew Stafford. That list is very short. And no, you know, no disrespect to Brock Purdy because he, to me, he's a leg- legitimate MVP candidate. But a lot of people will say head to head, if he had to go quarterback, they would take Matthew Stafford. So it's, you know, that's, that's an edge that the Rams have. And I think that the, with the momentum that they have going right now, that they can really ride. And he hasn't been sacked the last two games. So, you talk about strides that this O-line has made from last year to this year. I mean, it is the world of difference. It is. It was amazing watching what they were doing to the Cleveland Browns. And this dude, Steve Avila, hey, man, he's a beast. Like, so Cleveland has arguably the best guard in the NFL, one of the best guards in Joel Batonia, who just moves people. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, I, I am telling you, this guy, Steve Avila, guard, the way he can move, get out on swing passes, what they like to do to physically dominate on the interior for some of those physical runs that they're having with Kyron Williams. I love what they're doing offensively. I love that they have decided that, hey, we may not be the greatest pass protection team, but we can maul. And if we're in a situation where we have some advantages personnel-wise or schematically to run the football inside, we've got the guys who want to get down on their knuckles, line up, and blow guys off the ball. That is a different type of of offense than we've seen out of the Rams. And, and I love it. I mean, they can, they can go to Green Bay and play play that type of physical football if they have to. And again, that is, that is I hope they continue to build this team that way because the most successful teams we're seeing in the NFL are built through their offensive and defensive fronts. Like you said, arguably the best defense in the NFL was the Browns, but it, it doesn't necessarily get any easier in Baltimore this upcoming week. No. What does the Rams offense need to do to put up points on the board? I mean, they put up, 36 points against the Browns, which is what, like we said, one of the best defenses in in the NFL. Can they replicate that this weekend? Well, I mean, part of what they have to do against the Ravens, who who are coming off of a bye, um, they have to get some takeaways. I mean, we saw, you know, Flacco through the one interception, great play by John Johnson against his whole team to make the, to make the pick short in the field, but that's what they have to do. They've got to deny the Ravens some opportunities um, but offensively, it, it's going to be tough sledding. I mean, uh, Brandon Matabuike, some of the guys on that defensive line for the Ravens are good, and they are an aggressive front. They've got two great inside linebackers, Roquan Smith and Patrick Queen, who can cover a lot of ground. So they may have to line up and play some power football at times because the range of the players on the Ravens' defense – I mean, Kyle Hamilton at safety is is – 
to me, one of the top three or four defensive players in the NFL. He can line up at free, strong, play some outside linebacker techniques. I mean, he, he covers a tremendous amount of territory. So they're going to have to try, if they can, to hit some explosive plays early and get the Ravens into a game where they're throwing the ball a lot. That's I wouldn't encourage that a lot these days, the way Lamar is playing. This is going to be a very, very tough game. But again, control the ball, and they've got to get probably at least two takeaways, whether they're fumble recoveries, interceptions, whatever, to deny the Ravens some possessions and keep this game kind of mudded up and keep it to like under 21 points, you know, for, for either team. Yeah, the Rams defense hasn't allowed more than 20 points in each of their last four games. So the, the defense deserves to, to a that ton point, of credit. Erica, sorry to interrupt you. You know, as a national guy here, and, and I speak on it, Raheem Morris – and the job that his staff have done, Chris Shula, Chris Beak, all of these guys, Eric Henderson, that defense with only one recognizable superstar in Aaron Donald is just amazing at keeping teams off the scoreboard and making them kick right. field goals. They are not getting enough credit. And again, maybe if they beat the Ravens, people will will see what you know you have seen repeatedly week after week, what I've seen being local here in Los Angeles. But all props to the way this defense is playing. Because, you know, forget the yards. Scoring defense, turnover margin, and third down defense are the important metrics by how you should be judged. And this is where Raheem Morris and that staff and those players have really excelled. And not to mention, Raheem Morris saved a life this summer. Like, what can't this man do? Like, he is incredible. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like that go I'm just every time I look at him he's like out there smiling and the defense is just blowing teams up not allowing more than 20 points and it's like oh yeah he also saved a child like that that just blows my mind he's he's so cool again I mean he he's the guy hopefully he gets some more head coaching interviews I know the Rams would hate to lose him but he deserves a shot yeah. because the one thing that the NFL is lacking when it comes to head coaches are culture builders you know we have all these great schematics Fengali's but if you can't recognize what's in your locker room and build a culture around it like Sean McVay does so exceedingly well, um, you're not going to win. And Raheem Morris is somebody who, yes, he can scheme up things, but he recognizes culture. He recognizes what type of locker room he has. Or or if you've got a couple players who may have learning disabilities or a couple guys, veteran players who – you know, may need to care more about their their families this week. But he recognizes all of that, puts his arm around it, and gets everybody to embrace what they need to do and say, hey, this is part of it, guys. We can have this and go out there and play good games of football on Sunday. Yeah, totally. And and one of the best smiles in the NFL. I'm a teeth girl. One of the best smiles. Got you got to give it to Raheem. <laughs> you really do. You really do. So Lamar Jackson, what – challenges, you know, aside from the the running aspect, does Lamar Jackson present to a defense? Well, I mean, he's throwing the ball all over the place now. I mean, in terms of from the pocket, they do a great job of moving the pocket, not to set up a run, but this is what mobile quarterbacks did back in the old days, back when there was the old option offenses and you didn't have all the nickel. Where the quarterback can run towards a line of scrimmage to force a defender either to come off of a receiver or somehow get him in no man's land and just pop the ball over the defender's head. I mean, they do that an awful lot. So that mobility, the fact that he can take it and run it, the fact that they are running it well, um, this little dynamo back that they got out of East Carolina who runs like a 4-1, you know, now they've got tremendous speed options to accompany him instead of just really slick type of running backs. They've got a power back in Gus Edwards. So there's so many things where they utilize all those different tools. But Lamar, again, the fact he is throwing so well out of the pocket, the quick game has really opened up things. And, you know, with Mark Andrews being out, I think they're going to take this bye week to figure out how to incorporate Isaiah Likely a little bit more there, but their tight end replacing Andrews into their passing game. You know, he's an explosive type of hybrid tight end. I think they're going to find some things to do with Likely, and that's something that the Rams have to prepare for that they probably didn't see before, you know, two weeks ago before the Ravens went on this bye. Yeah. It'll be nice to see Odell again too. I think that'll, that'll be interesting. Yeah. Um, Steve, before I let you go, I got to ask you my Ram jam questions, the rapid fire. Okay. If you were to have your last meal on earth, what would it be? 
My last meal on earth would definitely be Indian food. Mm-hmm. Um, I could eat it 47 times a week. It would probably <laughs> be some form of t- of a tikka masala. Okay. Um, with a little basmati rice to go there. Okay. Um, I would probably have it with a nice chill glass of, of barefoot Sauvignon Blanc to take a little bit of the heat okay. edge off of it. Okay. Yeah. Um, but it, w- it would absolutely be Indian food again. The most spectacular okay. food in the world. How about you, Erica? I, I got, I, I mean, it's not a one way street here. What do you got for me? E? See, I, I need, I can't stick to one. Like mine would be a total appetizer sampler plate. Like I would have okay. like a little bit of tacos. I would have maybe some Buffalo. Like it's my last meal. Calories don't count. Like I'm going to line up every <laughs> single thing. Maybe have some ice cream at the end, maybe some mochi to like really kind of oh. cleanse the palate in between, okay. you know, maybe like a, like a ribeye steak, a nice marbled steak. See now I'm, I'm just salivating. So I, I physically could not, if it's my last meal on earth, I'm probably going to die from the amount of food that I intake. That is that, <laughs> that would be my plan. There is nothing like being checked out under a food coma pretense. Yeah. If it's my last meal on earth, I want to take the control back, you know? So I am going I, to make sure that it's it's my own doing that I, that I get to put myself out. <laughs> love it. Love it. <laughs> if you could live in an amusement park, shopping center, or other fun place, where would you choose and why? I mean, what's the definition of fun? Because I'm not big on So crowds. your definition. Yeah. It's your definition though. Oh, come on. That's easy. I would be freaking in a vineyard somewhere, um, mm. you know, just hanging yeah. out with an en- with an endless bottle, uh, you know, at this yeah. age, you know, when I was, when I was, you know, 10 years ago, I might've said a, a beach or something. But one thing about me, as much as I'm around stadiums, I am not a crowd person. I have been shopping online for the holidays for the past 20 years because I will not set foot <laughs> in a mall unless it was an, the ultimate emergency. So right. yeah, something where I am isolated. Yeah. So you in the tunnel surrounded by all of those mascots on Sunday wasn't your first choice? That's weird. I thought I thought you would have. Well, that was actually kind of cool. Here's a cool story (laughs) behind it. I know you saw the video, but I was actually talking with former NBA star and now social media whiz Gilbert Arenas. Because I used to cover Gilbert when I used to cover the NBA. I I worked in Washington. He played for the Wizards when he was agent zero. His daughter was one of the, the cheerleaders for the Rams that day. And then I accidentally... Stumbled into the Wizards mascot. Was it the Niners mascot? The the Bills yep. mascot. It was great. That was good. I yeah, mean, that it was like halftime an anti-social oh distancing thing, but it was it was all good. They didn't say <laughs> they didn't talk to me. That was it. They didn't right. talk to me. That was good. Right, right. Yeah, some of the best conversations I've had have been with Rampage. You know, I just really get out all my feelings, and then he doesn't say anything back. So it's it's really therapeutic oh, to be around mascots. <laughs> um, Steve, lastly, what would a collage? Of your life include we're printing out photos of steve weish to hang up on the wall what's going on the collage oh it'd be so boring no it would be like a lot of you know like like the young years would be like all athletic photos you know me playing football baseball um whatever and then you know you get up into the 20s and 30s it'd be kind of cool you know with some of the athletes i got to cover mike tyson evander holyfield riddick bow Gilbert Arenas, things like that. Yeah. At this age, the collage would probably be like a million pictures with me, my wife, and our grandson who just turned one years old. It would be nothing. I saw but the photos on Instagram. Oh my oh, goodness! Oh, he's amazing. So <laughs> not the kids though. You can skip the kids. Just just the grandson on the collage. Oh yeah, well, once you have grandchildren, it's over. Like thanks, thanks it's, for bringing yeah, it him into matter. the world, guys. We have nothing to do. You with did you. your job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's maybe right. a bottle of wine on there. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. think I think that's a that's a beautiful collage. I love that. Steve, there thank you so much for your insight and your time. As always, I, I, like I said, I love getting to watch football with you and just listen to your mind work. It makes me a better football spectator, and I feel much more excited and confident going into this game, Rams versus the Ravens. There you go. Appreciate you. Salud. Cheers. All right. Cheers, Steve. I'll see you next time. All right. That does it for this week's Ricky's Ram Jam. Make sure you check out the Cooper Cup Walter Payton Man of the Year. It was such a touching video. I love to see it. There's so much going on. Keep it locked. All things Rams. And you know, let's ram it.
Thanks for watching. Make sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss out on our videos.